So in conclusion for each of these hypotheses, each of these hypotheses that we've tested, we know that the, our first hypothesis predicted that individuals' expectation of pain would be positively associated with their experience of pain. And that's exactly what we found. So there was a significant positive, although weak, correlation between negative affect expectation and negative affect experience. Our second hypothesis was the paired t-test. So looking at the difference between people's expectations of pain, thinking that would be worse than their actual experience of pain. And that hypothesis wasn't supported. So no, there was no significant difference between people's expectations and actual experience of pain. Our third hypothesis said that individuals with a higher somatic symptom burden will have more negative expectations of pain compared to those with low somatic symptom burden. And yet that's exactly what we found, that there was an almost 10% worse negative expectancy between those, in a high, those with high somatic symptom burden compared to low somatic symptom burden. Their expectancy was about 10%, almost 10% worse compared to those with low somatic symptom burden. And we also found that the mindfulness instructions did result in less negative experience of the task compared to the control instructions. So mindfulness resulted in more than a 10% less negative affect experience compared to control. So we had four different hypotheses. We've got support for three of them and no support for the second one for hypothesis two there. The last point that I want to make um, in terms of what we can take away from these particular hypotheses being supported and the particular results that we've got is to make a distinction between the kind of conclusion we can make for hypothesis three and the kind of conclusion we can make for hypothesis four. So you might have noticed a slight difference in the expression of hypothesis three and hypothesis four. And that's to do with the different ways that somatic symptom burden and mindfulness were actually measured in our study. So let's take somatic symptom burden. We said that individuals with high somatic symptom burden would have more negative expectations. And that's exactly what we found. But what we can't say here is that the reason their expectancies were different is due to their somatic symptom burden. All we can say is that there's a relationship between their somatic symptom burden level and their expectations. So we can say there's a difference between the groups, but we can't say that somatic symptom burden causes them to have different negative expectations. That the reason that the high somatic symptom burden group has more negative expectation is because of or caused by their high somatic symptom burden. We can't say that because we didn't randomly allocate people to having high versus low somatic symptom burden. It's a non-experimental manipulation. They're naturally occurring groups. And therefore, we can't make a causal conclusion between somatic symptom burden and expectations. In fact, it could be differences in expectation that cause to bring about differences in somatic symptom burden. Or it could be other variables that affect both somatic symptom burden and both their expectations. So because this, these are naturally occurring groups, we can't conclude that somatic symptom burden causes the differences in negative expectancies. For hypothesis four, though, that's exactly what we can conclude. So we can say that there's a difference between the two mindfulness groups in their experience of the task. And we can also say that mindfulness causes that difference because individuals were randomly allocated to either the mindfulness or the control group. And therefore, the groups are identical on everything else except for the induction that they experienced. That there's no naturally occurring differences between those in the mindfulness group versus the control group other than that particular audio that they experienced, other than whether they were told to be mindful or told to not be mindful. So we can say that mindfulness causes the difference in negative experiences because we were randomly allocating people to groups because we had that experimental control. And that's a really important point to make, I think, in this instance, because even though the analysis was identical between hypothesis three and hypothesis four, the variables involved were the same in that we had one categorical variable and one numeric variable in both hypothesis three and hypothesis four. But the conclusions that we make have to be dictated by the design of the variables and the design of the study.
So because our design was an experimental design for hypothesis four, that can allow us to make causal conclusions. Whereas we didn't have an experimental design for hypothesis three, we had naturally occurring groups for somatic symptom burden, and therefore we can't make causal conclusions. We can't make a causal interpretation of the association between somatic symptom burden and expectancies. So in conclusion here, we've finished our individual project for this week's lecture. We've finished our general analysis, our kind of broader analysis of this one research design and a number of different kinds of hypotheses and different sorts of tests. And as I said at the start of today, this is quite indicative of what real life research projects are like. So you tend to have, say, one research study with a number of different variables that you measure and a number of different hypotheses that you test and therefore a number of different kinds of statistical analyses that you need to run for that one research project. So each hypothesis has its own variables involved and its associated statistical tests that's required to actually address that hypothesis. And hopefully you can identify now that there's this really step-by-step -step process in a statistical analysis which starts with identifying the hypothesis or the multiple hypotheses by running the general descriptive statistics in order to understand the sample and understand the data that we collected and then to work out for each hypothesis what the variable or variables are that are involved in that hypothesis. So both what the variables are but also what type of variables they are, numeric versus categorical then to identify what the appropriate statistical test is for each of those hypotheses. And hopefully that decision tree back earlier in today's lecture, back on slide four, can help you make that decision. Then for each individual statistical test, we need to check the assumptions for that test, see if those assumptions are met before we can then run the test and make any kinds of conclusions after the end of that. And as you saw, hopefully on the previous slide, the conclusions that we can make are based on both the test that we ran and the result of the test, but also the design of the study and the particular kind of experimental control or lack of experimental control that we had over the variables involved. So hopefully today's lecture has put all of the individual tests that we've run in a context, in a broader context. I know that we haven't run every single test, all of the six tests we've run throughout the semester weren't covered today, but it's a little bit difficult to cover all of them. So I've just focused on the most important ones to hopefully emphasize the commonalities between the tests in terms of the processes involved and the interpretation that we make, but also hopefully to highlight the differences between the tests in terms of the variables involved and the kinds of research questions or hypotheses that they addressed. So goodbye for today.